Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for coming out and enjoying some wine and cheese and some political economics of media with all of us. It should be a rip-roaring, wonky time this evening. Um, if you had looked at the agenda, I am happy to report that we have a special guest here tonight. Uh, Michael Copps is a friend and colleague. He's been in this space for feels like eons, holding forth uh, a veteran of numerous battles. He went in for a, a tour of duty as an FCC chairman and then re-upped, which is a real brave, possibly foolhardy thing to do. But thank goodness he was here. He's been a, a vocal critic when necessary uh, and a public interest champion always. And in the time that I've been involved in DC politics, I've often look to him as sort of a beacon uh, in terms of holding forth and holding the line on numerous policy battles. He was also the lone vote in a four to one vote, the lone vote uh, against the Comcast universal merger. And I'm just going to quote him very quickly because I think if you want a very hard hitting synopsis of what was wrong, he said of the merger, this is too much too big, too powerful, too lacking in benefits for American consumers and citizens. And he said that from a position of an FCC commissioner here in DC. And I would say that takes extraordinary bravery to tell a truth of that sort. So currently, Mr. Copps is senior advisor over at Common Cause for their media and democracy reform initiative. He has his work cut out for him but I'm very thankful that he is still here in DC battling away at many of the problems that plague our media system today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him and he will introduce tonight's headliner, uh, Susan Crawford. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sasha. Thank you everybody for being here. This is a Wonderful testament to uh, Susan to see this uh, crowd here tonight. Uh, I got a copy of this book and I immediately became the captive reader to the captive audience and I, I really strongly recommend it uh, uh, to you. The telecom industry and monopoly power in the Gilded Age. I think it's just a fascinating read. And I'll tell you, I never thought that somebody could take maybe a page or two and make pole attachments a really fascinating read. <laughs> she did it. But this book isn't uh, about uh, pole attachments. It's about the, uh, the world uh, we live in and the, and the future of information in America. And it's, uh, it's exceedingly well done. But I'm, I'll let Susan uh, talk about the book. But if you want to understand uh, how this place works and uh, how people lobby and how influence gets wheeled and how, wielded and how decisions affecting every one of us as consumers and more importantly as citizens get made, you need to get a copy of, uh, of this book. I met Susan uh, long ago. By the way, we should wish her happy birthday because yesterday was her birthday. I uh, met her uh, as a commissioner at the FCC, and then she uh, reappeared in the uh, transition uh, up to the uh, Obama administration as a, uh, a leader of that transition, and we worked very closely uh, together, very intensively together for a number of months because some of you may recall the wonderful DTV transition we were going through at that time. And I'm even happier if you don't recall it because that means it worked okay. <laughs> But, uh, but we worked closely together, and uh, uh, she did a, a wonderful uh, job in that. But she has really found uh, her voice as uh, one of the most articulate spokespersons we have, I think, in the United States of America uh, on telecom. And she is blazing trails with this book, uh, with the work she does for uh, Wired. Uh, with uh, the frequency with which she writes op-eds for the New York Times, and I think she is fast becoming recognized as uh, one of the preeminent uh, analysts, uh, commentators, historians, visionaries, however you want to put it, 
on uh, telecom, and it's, uh, uh, it's so important, and I think we're starting to get some traction. I certainly hope so, thanks to uh, uh, this book and thanks to many people in this room and the programs that you all are, uh, uh, are working on. So uh, we're ve I'm very proud of, uh, of Susan, of the uh, association and the friendship that we have had. I'm proud of the work she has done at uh, uh, and with her law professorship at Cardozo, recently just finished up a visiting uh, professorship at, uh, uh, at Harvard and just involved in, in so many different facets of uh, uh, telecommunications. So uh, I urge you not only to uh, buy and to read this book, but to, to help spread its message. Uh, it's, it's aptly named uh, Telecom and Monopoly Power in the New Gilded Age. I used to back many eons ago before modern history was even written. I used to teach American history, fresh out of graduate school, and my specialty was actually the Gilded Age. And I can say with some confidence, having been in this town for 40 years and having studied that history, that I don't think the power and influence of money in our society even back during that original Gilded Age of the 1870s and 1880s has ever been greater than it is right now. And these are such important decisions that the FCC is making on uh, uh, telecom and media monopolies and duopolies. And in the final analysis, it goes beyond just who's providing access to you for broadband. It goes to the nature of our civic dialogue and the sustenance of our civic dialogue. And are we getting the news and the information that we need to have to be intelligent citizens able to make, help make important decisions for a country that's in a deep, deep hole right now with no get out of the hole free card? Uh, really important. Uh, so that's what makes this industry so important, that's what makes this uh, book so important. And I couldn't be happier that Susan is in the vanguard. I hope you all saw her on Bill Moyers uh, a couple of weeks ago. She and Bill had what can only be described as a vibrant and uh, intelligent and uh, rousing discussion. It was, it was really excellent. So we thank Susan for all the good things she has already done. And uh, we just know there are great things ahead too and we are proud to be on uh, uh, on the road uh, with her so to speak so without further ado uh, let me introduce uh, Susan and happy birthday and congratulations on writing a fascinating captivating captive audience Cops proves once again that he's the soul of graciousness. It's awfully nice. And it's wonderful to see so many friends here tonight, friends and former students and people who I admire. I'm just delighted to get the chance to talk to all of you. And I also know, because I know so many of you, that you are an imaginative group. So cast your mind back, if you will, to the early 1930s, when electricity in America was considered a luxury. Running water, yes, everybody needed that, but not electricity. Robert Caro has written very movingly of the people living in hill country outside Austin, who said, we heard all about Roosevelt's wonderful fireside chats. We read about them, we knew about them, we loved FDR, but we couldn't actually hear the chats themselves because we didn't have electricity. At the time, 90% of farmers didn't have electricity, even while rich kids in New York City were playing with electric toys. Roosevelt comes in in the 30s, and from his long experience in Georgia, understands the grinding effect that a lack of electricity or expensive electricity can have on people, and really throws himself into this and makes sure that there's a universal, high quality, reasonably priced utility service of electricity available to everyone around the country. So now cast your mind forward. Here in Washington, it's about 6 o'clock, 6.30. If you are living out in the suburbs someplace, it's quite possible that you need to take your kids 
to the parking lot of the local library in order to do their homework. Why is that? Because for many Americans who don't have a wired high-speed internet access connection at home, the only way to get access to the data flow that those kids need to get an education, and footnote here, wonderful Pew report today about the digital divide being exacerbated by the educational opportunities that aren't available to lower income kids who don't have wired internet access at home. So these parents and their kids are parking in parking lots to get access to Wi-Fi that might have been left on by the library at night. Same thing, big article recently in Wall Street Journal about, on the front page, about people doing their homework, kids doing their homework in McDonald's where free Wi-Fi access is available. We've got a problem in America in a short, and it has to do with the situation of wired internet high-speed access. Fully 19 million Americans don't have access where they live at any price. About a third of Americans in total aren't subscribing, including 2.2 million Americans in my hometown of New York City. And many of them do it because of price. They don't subscribe because it's too expensive. There are other reasons. They're not sure how relevant it is to their lives. But a third of Americans, 100 million, don't have that access in their home. For many of us, it's extremely expensive, whether or not we're in the market for uh, very high-speed wireless access or wired access in the home. It's squeezing out other basic needs of human beings, things like food, gas, <laughs> clothing, electricity. It's expensive, and in America, it's slow in comparison to other countries. I took a vacation in Seoul the first week of January, very cold place to go on vacation. People there told me that coming to America was like taking a rural vacation. They actually use this hand gesture. For an American, this is very embarrassing. They go like this. Life slows down when you come to America. So even though you need a wired, high-speed internet connection in order to get a fine education, to apply for a job, certainly, to get the best health care available, to find a new business for yourself, start that new business. We don't have the kind of universal, world-class access that the country that started this whole thing off, the internet, should have. And I think it's a problem for us, for economic growth, as well as equality and fairness. Even though other basic uh, needs of humans are treated as utilities, things like gas and electricity and uh, you know, just the ability to find a home, um, high-speed internet access is not. It's still a luxury. It's almost as if it's no more important to us than the corner deli, even though it's essential for every part of uh, human life these days. So I wrote this book to try to explain the problem and explain how we got here. How we got here is that we believed that the magic of the marketplace would protect us when it came to high-speed internet access. That we'd find a way to uh, have telephone connections compete with cable modem connections and that they would be roughly the same price and they'd be battling with each other and that would provide access to all Americans as well as keep prices down and protect consumers. We also believe that wireless access would pressure these wired connections and keep the whole market rolling around. It turns out that we were wrong. We were wrong. Although in 2001, 2002, a cable modem connection was about the same price and speed as a telephone DSL connection, since then, it's turned out to be much cheaper to upgrade the cable connection and uh, make it faster than it is to dig up the telephone copper line and replace it with fiber. And so Verizon, who had been rolling out fiber um, that would pressure the cable connections, has backed off. And we're left with a situation in which for wired internet access, for most of America, more than 80% of Americans, your only choice is going to be your local cable monopolist. The wireless access, it's fine as a substitute for a slow cable connection, but based on usage caps, it's not going to be a substitute for the kinds of things you can do using your wired connection. And it's just not giving the same capacity that a wired cable connection can. So we've ended up 
with two separate marketplaces, wired, almost wholly controlled by the cable local monopolists, and they are monopolists. Comcast and Time Warner long ago divided up the country among themselves. You take San Francisco, I take Minneapolis, um, in something they called the Summer of Love in 1997. <laughs> and uh, uh, Verizon and AT&T by far dominate the wireless marketplace. You may think of these companies as telephone companies, wired telephone companies, but more than two-thirds of Verizon's revenues these days come from the wireless side. They're really over there in wireless where they get at least uh, two-thirds of subscribers are signing up with Verizon and AT&T, and most of the free cash flow, everything uh, on that wireless side is going to those two companies who have enormous, enormous advantages of scale and scope and barriers to entry in the form of uh, low band frequencies that allow them to build fewer towers to have national coverage, and uh, the rich keep re getting richer on the wireless side. So let's take a look at internet access uh, the, from the past to the future. This is a time series in a sense. You can read this chart from the left to the right. This is based on data from the FCC and echoed actually by a report just a couple of weeks ago from the FCC about 2011 numbers. So when it comes to one megabit per second download service, broadband five years ago, there were competitors. Cable and DSL were dividing the market between each other. And also available might have been some fiber to the node services by AT&T, they call it UVerse service, and also uh, fiber to the home from uh, Verizon. So two technologies meeting the demand, a possibility of competition. Then as you move to the right, for 10 megabit service and above, cable has stands alone for, let's say, 51 to 57 percent of Americans. There's still the possibility of UVerse with its pretty fast downloads. By the way, very cramped uploads on the UVerse side. And fiber to the home still there for about 14% of Americans. But for what we're going to need for the high bandwidth, low latency applications that we're all going to be relying on for the future, cable stands alone for at least 80% of the country, the only form of technology meeting that demand. There's still some fiber to the home provided by Fios. It's a fine service. In fact, it's a better service because it has symmetrical upload as well as very fast downloads. But Verizon announced in March 2010 that it wasn't going to be expanding Fios beyond what it had already built, leaving cities like Alexandria and, and Boston without uh, the Fios that they've been hoping for. And they have ceded the wired side of this marketplace to cable for most of America. As a result, Comcast faces Fios competition in just 15% of its footprint, and Comcast really is enormous. It covers 50 million American households. About 45% of the American population is in Comcast territory. And Time Warner faces competition from Fios in only about 11% of its territory. It's a great business to be in if you're the cable company. Notice that fiber to the node, FTTN, that's the UVerse service, has just dropped out of this chart on the far right because it's not able to provide the kind of speeds that cable is going to be providing. So for everything we do, for data, information, education, telemedicine, all of these high bandwidth, high capacity, low latency experiences, cable has won. This is great for these companies. Uh, so here's Comcast's average revenue climbing from 2002 to 2012. This company is not evil. It's very well managed. It's a great American success story, starting in 1963 with the purchase of just a few systems and expanding through consolidation ever since. It's just that the incentives desired by their shareholders don't necessarily align with the social needs of the country as a whole for a ubiquitous, universal, reliable, and very high-speed, world-class communications infrastructure. We don't seem to have a path to fiber for the rest of the country. Cable as a result of its ability to offer these very high speeds is now grabbing much more of the mind share when it comes to high-speed wired internet access. So where, see in 2006, 
the telcos would have been getting about half of the new subscriptions. Now cable gets 94% for 2012 of all net ads, all new subscriptions for broadband across the country. 99% of subscriptions in the fourth quarter of 2012 went to the local cable incumbent, which again faces no competition, no oversight, and has no reason to keep prices in check or act as a non-discriminatory purveyor of, of transmissions. Here's Brian Roberts, terrific manager. This is what he said in May 2011. He said, think of Comcast as basically a broadband company. And in our uh, territories, he said, we're 33%, 31% penetrated. The goal would be 100 or 90. We have one competitor. And that one competitor is Fios. Over the next 10 years, people will want more bits in their house. I like that position. Well, of course he likes that position. It means that for everything we're going to want to do using these wired connections, Comcast can get a piece of the pie, a little bit of flesh, um, uh, you know, an opportunity to make more money from the same number of people, which again, not evil, very smart from the position of a giant cable company. On the wireless side, so this is the Verizon AT&T story where they, as I said earlier, have most of the subscribers and almost all of the low band spectrum. Um, we have a slightly less concentrated but still very powerful uh, dominated marketplace by these uh, two enormous companies. So as I said, they, they've really become more like uh, they are wireless companies where two thirds of Verizon's revenue coming from the wireless side. Verizon even more of a wireless company because it's dumped some of its unprofitable wireline uh, connections, if, particularly in the nor Northeast. This, I saw this uh, with, in, with great drama after Sandy uh, when Verizon in New York City ripped out copper to replace it with fiber. Um, and here, uh, AT&T also uh, becoming much more of a wireless company than wired. Here's a comparison chart coming from Stanford Bernstein showing that where in Europe, competition is driving revenue per capita down for the wireless companies. In America, it's steadily climbing. The two giants, Verizon and AT&T, who have so much of a lead over Sprint and T-Mobile, can do things like impose usage caps, um, drive uh, users into shared buckets of bits so they, they get more and more opportunities to monetize those households and uh, things are going relatively well for those companies. Again, not evil, just the way that shareholders would want them to act. This was brought up by uh, Chairman Copps in his introduction, the idea that um, not only are we facing very market powerful actors in these separate realms of wireless and wired, um, we're also seeing the launching of really uh, broad arguments that they are speakers, that the First Amendment protects their activities even when all they're doing is transmitting bits from point A to point B. And this argument is being raised most colorfully right now in the DC Circuit um, where there's a, a case pending that will be decided later this year. Verizon is asserting we're a, we're a speaker, we're protected by the First Amendment, in effect that their First Amendment rights trump those of 300 million Americans. We've had for 100 years a tradition of trusting our communications to private companies in exchange for their promise not to discriminate and not to send our communications over to Topeka when we were trying to reach people in Pittsburgh. Um, if Verizon prevails with this argument, it will be presumptively unconstitutional for Congress or the FCC to do anything about communications regulation. So we are resilient and cheerful by nature. What should happen? And it's terrifically uh, pleasant to talk about this in Washington because you guys have the power to actually do something about this. A first and most important, I think, element of this story would be to ensure that mayors have the power to uh, call for the creation of, wire, of uh, fiber loops around their cities that are wholesale fiber connections that allow for a lot of retail competition. Mayors can execute on these plans and get their local communities to be part of the successful economic growth story accompanied, with, um, accompanied by a, a fiber network. Right now, it's difficult or impossible in many states in the United States to have this happen. 19 states have barriers to municipal networks. 
By the way, these networks wouldn't have to be community owned. They could be privately run as long as they're subject to oversight. We should find a way to preempt the state laws that have made it difficult or impossible for uh, cities to do this and return the power of local determination to uh, cities in the United States. This will have a shaming effect on the rest of the country as we're seeing with the Google network in Kansas City, as we understand just how valuable a gigabit connection can be. Did you know that Kansas City's um, credit rating has gone up since it announces it, its fiber optic plans? That's pretty dramatic. And we'll see more and more of these networks in Seattle and Chicago and Boston. We should make it as easy as possible for the cities of America to do this. We should also ensure that if you're a uh, provider of transmission services, that you act as just conduit and not also be in the position of providing content. Dividing up uh, networks between wholesale and retail makes a lot of sense for areas in which competition is possible, and that should be a policy move that the country as a whole takes, so that we all have the advantages of open networks and the economic growth and opportunities for new jobs and new ways of making a living that those networks provide. A lot of this is just about money. There's no magic here. Um, making it possible for new entrants to show up and build those uh, fiber loops around cities is going to be essential. So some way of uh, building local infrastructure banks that fund new networks and get paid back over a very long uh, period of time is going to be extremely important. And right now, that's not happening. And it would be a big next step to make that possible. It's finally, it's going to be important to ensure that the uh, transmission operator has no built-in conflict of interest to favor their own material. At the moment, uh, they're subject to no limitations, and that puts in the power of, of these gatekeepers uh, enormous authority to pick winners and losers, and it's a problem. Most importantly for me right now, what I'm trying to do with this talk to you and by urging you to buy the book and get your friends to buy the book is to just put this issue on the radar screen. Right now, Americans are a little confused by the shiny objects, new devices, a little confusion about how wireless fits with wired, what the relationships are between these markets. And they have the feeling that there's something wrong because they're paying a lot and there's something wrong because they have few choices. But they don't understand the market dynamics that are in place right now, and they don't seem to have a feeling that they can change the story. We should be encouraging people to vote people, uh, new representatives, into office on the basis of their commitment to bring fiber connections to their local community. This has happened in other countries. It should happen here. And I'm hoping that the book is playing a role in pushing along the public dialogue to get much more attention paid to this issue. So when you go home, uh, think tonight about the lovely electric light that you turned on. The country called for electricity. And we made sure that as a public trust, everybody got a basic connection to electricity that was affordable, resilient, available. What's basic today for high-speed internet access, I'm going to put this on the table, is a 100 megabit per second symmetric connection. We've got to find a way to get there for the country. And as you turn on your lovely electric light, remember that it took a political effort backed by a president, backed by many representatives on the Hill, to make that happen. It is up to us to dedicate ourselves to ensure that high-speed internet access becomes that kind of issue for the country. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, you like that? I'm happy? OK. Thanks. All right, so while Susan grabs her breath, I will uh, <laughs> regale you with a couple of logistical things, which are that we're going to talk for, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes until we get bored, and then we're going to open it up for far more interesting questions from the audience. So start pondering what you would like to ask Susan now, because you will have a chance. And I thought I'd get things started. Um, you know, I will say, reading this book, it was like so full of interesting tidbits. I loved that there was like sourcing throughout and I found myself constantly like going down the rabbit's hole. It was sort of 
Wikipedia in book form in terms of just being able to follow things back. Uh, and I think that really is the marker of true scholarship. Is that in essence, you're saying like, you don't have to take my word for it. Here's all the sourcing behind what I'm telling you. And I think that's sorely lacking in a lot of debates inside DC today. Where it's like, on the one hand, you have science. And on the other hand, you have like, no, trust me, I've got this great opinion. And then you have decision makers that are sort of like, how do I balance this? And your book was really just chock-a-brock full of a historical context of where we'd been before, of what the outcomes from these historical eras, when we failed to act or when we acted in ways that we are now paralleling today. Mm -hmm. And I think that's incredibly important. I would urge any anyone, but especially our key decision makers working in telecom, like pick this thing up mm. Thank you. and learn from that history. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I thought I'd, I'd start with maybe something a little bit lighter, which is we've been working together for years, and I remember distinctly the first time we sat down and really sort of dreamed big, and it was in this bar, I think in Boston, and you said, I have this idea. I think we need like an Earth Day for the internet, like something that sort of highlights the positive potentials for this technology as it spreads across the country and globally. And so you convinced me in a matter of minutes that it was worthwhile <laughs> to have a holiday, a national, a global holiday to celebrate one web. And I was wondering if you could maybe talk a little bit about like why you thought that was necessary. It was sort of way before anyone else thought this was sexy. You were like there <laughs> and wanting to hold up the importance of this medium for society writ large. Well, thank you for remembering One Web Day, which still lives on in the Philippines. They're still doing it. No one told them that, you know, anyway. It, it is a... Uh, Open Technology Institute has a happy hour every year. Yeah, it's good. It's, it, <laughs> Well, I did that in 2006. I launched an Earth Day for the Internet called One Web Day every September 22nd. The reason I did that is that we don't make progress on big social issues unless we can see them, unless we understand and take responsibility for uh, uh, problems. And in the, in the case of the Internet, I was very troubled that people were sort of beginning to understand it as broadcast TV or cable television, a passive experience delivered over screens that had all the hallmarks of an utterly commercial experience. And I knew that that wasn't right. I knew that actually Internet access was the most important development of my adult life. And the, and every, everybody else is that the, the notion of being able to start a business without permission to connect with anybody around the world to have the human experience of not being isolated because of internet access seemed to me so vital and so not understood that we needed a day when we would have people teaching each other how to edit wikis bounce a you know a virtual rubber ball across the cosmos i had all kinds of notions for this day earth day happened because we suddenly saw a picture of the Earth from space and realized how fragile our ecosystem was. We hadn't seen that before. Because the internet is not visible, I was worried that we would never have that moment of concern for the power that gatekeepers might have over internet access. And I wanted to make that visible. I think Earth, the One Web Day was a little ahead of its time because uh, we're now getting to the period when it really is getting to be like cable television. And a lot of uh, people don't understand how it works or how it's different from mediums in the past. And uh, I'm hoping that every day is now one web day for uh, people who care about the internet. And also September 22nd. And also September 22nd. That's Great. Um, you wrote uh, right towards the beginning, actually, uh, and you alluded to this as well. Uh, you know, instead of electricity or water, Comcast was gaining dominion over the country's latest utility infrastructure, high-speed internet access. Yeah. And for anyone that, that has a sort of a geeky, wonky type like myself, like you might be familiar with a guy, Andrew Odlesko, that writes a lot about trains. And you spent a good amount of time talking about 
uh, the collusion of the robber barons, which I thought was fascinating and incredibly important to understand. I was wondering, could you explain a little bit like how that collusion worked and how trains and oil all of a sudden got merged in a way that you wouldn't ordinarily think much to the detriment of, well, the entire rest of society? Well, when you've got a very uh, important commodity, let's say transportation or oil, and the ability to carve up markets and control that commodity with enough uh, speediness and access to capital, if consolidation is possible, competition is impossible. And we saw this in spades in the railroad era, where uh, systems that had been built independently were consolidated by uh, people who created trusts to run those systems. And then the uh, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil hooked up with the railroads. Uh, John Rockefeller was at, at that point of his career controlling 85% of oil production in America. And he said, look, you shippers of oil, railroad barons, I will guarantee you capacity. I'll pay for it and lo as long as you promise not to ship my competitors stuff. Or if you do, I'm going to ask for a drawback, a clawback. If you ship anything that one of my competitors has put off in, into the marketplace, um, I'm going to make sure that you never work in this town again. So with enormous uh, power over commodities and the ability to make deals that favor themselves, these actors were able to keep people outside their circle away from reasonably priced transport or oil. So you can see the same situation echoed in the tel telecommunications world. Very expensive to build telecommunications networks as a, as a first step. And then it, where consolidation is possible, competition is impossible. So in lots of consolidation in, in these worlds and the ability to constrain access, price it at will, keep uh, neighborhoods that don't have it out of the story, and just build an extraordinarily profitable business. So that the two are really um, quite comparable in the, the ways that, and now information and data is the oil of our era. And we've got a few very large companies uh, serving shareholders, but not necessarily serving our interests. And there's a certain irony, which you write a little bit about, of, of yeah. Theodore Roosevelt the head at one point of the Republican Party mm -hmm. uh, leading the charge, right? I mean, like he was right. adamant, like his people were like, this is bad. We have <laughs> to fix this and get things straightened out. Like, could, I mean, to me it was sort of interesting in that something is clearly flipped in the politics of today. Right. Well, this really isn't a right-left issue in my view, this problem of communications infrastructure. You can't have a free market where communications capacity is constrained. You can't have a free market where the ability to um, o open a new business with the input of communications as, as part of it is always a little uncertain. You can't have a free market where competition is a matter of choice by the gatekeeper who owns this essential infrastructure. So in the progressive era, uh, Rock-ribbed Republicans, I have a great-grandfather who was a golfer from New Jersey on the far right of the political spectrum. He was very irritated at the, at the power of the private utility companies in New Jersey to constrain capacity for transportation, to price at will, to make the running of businesses in New Jersey quite uncertain. And actually, at, in, during that era, farmers from the Midwest and conservatives from the East Coast join together to say, we can't stand the power of Standard Oil and the railroad, something has to be done. And what particularly irritated Teddy Roosevelt was that the combines treated him as a peer. They said, don't, don't prosecute us, just come and talk to us. We'll make a deal. He said, no, no, I'm the president. <laughs> we play different roles in society. And I think we've lost a little bit of that sense, or I, I worry that we've lost it, that you don't actually have to wait to hear what the stakeholders tell you is okay to do. You're allowed to act in the public interest and say, well, no, these, these uh, consumers aren't being protected. Prices are too high, speeds are too slow. We've got to do something. How do we get there? 
Roosevelt uh, thought that corporations of this kind, especially in the transportation infrastructure businesses, left unchecked would harm capitalism. And so he said, let's just stay involved. We're going to have oversight. Government has a role to play. That's the big picture for this book. Not that regulation in and of itself is the positive, but that government has a role to play in making sure that everybody has a very high speed, inexpensive, available, resilient, public safety friendly connection. That's just part of our function as a society. And today's joint ventures, I mean, we have sort of a merger acquisition yeah. uh, craziness that's happened over the last 10, 15 years now. Mm -hmm. uh, but I look at some of these joint ventures, and it's like if I just substituted a couple of names, Standard Oil, and JP Morgan for so, like, I mean, would, would the headlines and stories be meaningfully different today versus yeah. 100 years ago? Look, I think this is the tendency of large, um, infrastructure-based industries. But they want to be able to have lower unit costs over a great scale. That's the goal. The problem is when that tendency isn't accompanied by an obligation to serve everybody, in the case of something fundamental like communications or transportation, and to serve them in a non-discriminatory way, they will price discriminate. They'll just make more money from the same number of people. And that's what's happening today. Um, I think the joint marketing venture between uh, Verizon Wireless and Spectrum Co., which is the cable companies acting together, is, again, just exemplifying what's happened in the communications world, that they're not going to be fiercely competing, uh, that it's in their interest to divide the wireless market from wired and cooperate and jointly develop technology and uh, make things work better for their shareholders. And there's nothing bad about this. It's just not great for us. And it'd be nice to talk maybe a little bit about this competitive problem we yeah. have in terms of, A, what, like, what is meaningful competition? Because you hear all these numbers of like, we've got eight bazillion providers here in the United States, and I'm always like, why do I always have one or two, no matter where I seem to go <laughs> in the United States? Uh, but the FCC agrees. So in the National Broadband Plan, uh, they have a little pie chart with it. I think it's like page 37 mm -hmm. or something like that. It's like 96% of Americans, 96% of Americans have access to two or fewer wireline broadband providers. And you talked a little bit about how wireless and wireline are not mm -hmm. equivalent, and satellite obviously is not equivalent. Mm -hmm. So if 96% of Americans have access to two or fewer providers, how do we end up with claims of meaningful competition in this space regularly being made? Well, a lot of this has to do with market definition. So in the book, I'm particularly focused on the future. When it comes to what we're going to need for very high capacity, low latency connections, it's very clear that cable has won. And, and Fios is, has backed off and that the, we're stuck on this plateau, a non-fiber plateau with uh, cable in charge and no path to a fiber upgrade, which would give us the symmetrical upload and, and download. Um, if you say that broadband is anything from 1.5 megabit crappy wireless service to a fiber connection, you could say, yeah, there's a lot of competition. But that's like saying the Redskins are competing with Gonzaga High School's football team. They're just, they're in different worlds. And uh, so I think it's important to really focus on what we're going to need as a country. So in Seoul, if you move into an apartment in Seoul, you have a choice of three symmetric fiber competitors, at least. And they'll come to your house within a day because competition is so fierce. If they don't get there in a day, um, you'll give up on them. It's, we can't imagine that here. Uh, that's possible because the mayor of Seoul, even when it was illegal to do so, decided that a wholesale fiber ring in the subway made sense. And he was going to make sure that that was subsidized and built. Um, and so retail competition is fierce in that city. There are also lots of wireless competitors there too. So I think we've got this problem of not being very clear about what we need by basic, a basic high-speed internet connection. For me, it's 100 megabit per second symmetric connection. And New America did a nice report about the cost of connectivity around the world and how much more expensive that basic connection is in America than it is in many other countries. And that, for me, is the salient world we need to look at. 
Yeah, I mean, we looked at 22 cities and found that we were paying more for worse service. Yeah. More for worse service in the United States. Yeah, in Seoul, it's $30 a month for that 100 megabit service, which includes television. Say that again. $30, $30 a month. For how much? 100 megabit per second symmetric service with including television. <laughs> okay, anyway. That's just so painful. Look, <laughs> Seoul is a very dense area with lots of uh, apartment buildings. So mm -hmm. people will say, well, that, we can't compare that to any other city. That's apples and oranges. But as America thinks about leading the world, there are going to be big ideas coming from all corners of this country. And we didn't say to people with electricity, oh, you over there in Indianapolis, you don't get a real electrical connection because nothing great is going to come from Indianapolis. We decided that it made sense to have a standard connection for the entire country so you could plug in any device and uh, get it at a reasonable cost. We should be doing the same thing when it comes to high-speed internet access. It's just a utility. It's just a commodity. So let's let's talk a little bit about price gouging because I've, I've often heard this thing about well Seoul is very different they've got population density yeah. and so I'm like well that's why 100 megabit symmetric lines in New York City are 30 bucks a month right like obviously not well they're not yeah. exactly and so, so there's something else going on here but one of the interesting things we did is we looked at the differentials in costing so minimally we're paying 20 dollars more a month for worse service. And if we game that out, so there's over 100 million lines in the United States that people are paying for. It's like two billion extra dollars a month over that. It's over 25 billion extra dollars. This is extra right. dollars. So over the next 10 years, one decade, what we're really talking about is a quarter of a trillion dollars that we're overpaying for worse service than a growing list of other countries. And Given that graph you showed about the average revenue per user going in this <laughs> linear line, I mean, it was like, well, that wasn't just a one-off thing. This is clearly like just an unbelievable trend yeah. without end. There's something clearly weird going on here. And I, I'll bring it back to like a very individual level. So 15 months ago, I bought Comcast for the first time. Yeah. And I got my special $29.99 a month for a small pittance of what apparently they're getting in Seoul right now today. Right. In 15 months, it went from $29.99 to $47.99 to $64.99 to $69.99. This is just 15 months. And I can't fathom like how my price has gone up 130%. And that's OK in the United States. I can't fathom how over the last 10 years, average revenue has been skyrocketing, the profit margins have been skyrocketing. I thought like price gouging was not legal. You know, <laughs> if you're calling it names, uh, uh, this is just the ability to, when, you're, when you have a market cornered, it's a monopoly essentially, you can just keep raising prices and no competitor is going to enter to make it more difficult for you to charge mar prices that are so high above your margins. Right now, uh, a competitor in infrastructure for high-speed internet wired access has to enter two markets at once. Not only the market for building the infrastructure itself, but also the market for programming. So uh, the people trying to compete with a cable provider in any American city would have to somehow buy access to the sports and other things that Americans want to watch. What people may not know is that uh, smaller startup uh, fiber providers will end up paying three or four X what uh, a large distributor of cable access is paying for programming because there are volume discounts that are given to the large distributors, not given to the new ones. So all of this ability to charge more for programming, raise your arrivals costs by um, making it difficult to enter any, any new market, just allows you to raise prices. And so as long as Americans don't do anything about this, it's not illegal to raise your price. It's only illegal um, to act in any competitive fashion to leverage your monopoly control over one market into another. That's not necessarily happening here. So this is all about, in large cities where competition is possible, 
<laughs> opening up wholesale fiber rings would fix this and allowing for a lot of retail competition on top of that and then gradually rolling out into the suburbs and making sure that everybody gets fiber to the home. It's not magical. It can happen. It just takes a few steps and some political will to get it done. So if, if I went to my neighbors on my street, mm -hmm. like here we are, we're like 100 meters away from each other. I just said, said like, let's all discuss how much we're paying for our connectivity. Yeah. What do you think the probability is that we'd all be paying the same rate? Oh, uh, probably pretty low because there are a lot of special offers that people, maybe you're not a very good negotiator. Maybe somebody Ooh, else got be. a better <laughs> offer. <laughs> right, but this, this very uncertainty and one-offness of the pricing is also, frankly, a, a problem. Mm -hmm. Because if you're a, a business starting off, you want to be able to have this input be reliable. Uh, there's a famous story about a startup in, uh, that becomes a very big uh, tech company in Brooklyn, launching in Brooklyn and wanting very fast, very reliable service, and hearing back from Verizon that that'll be $3,000 a month without any you know, accounting for what that cost means or what they're going to be getting in terms of service level agreements for that cost. There's no oversight of this particular um, part of American society. So, no, so how do we to do it? Because well, one, one of the arguments I hear a lot is like, well, it costs us a lot of money yeah. to bring broadband to rural America. And so I'm like, well, you know, it also costs a lot of money to move to rural America. Oil, gas. Mm -hmm. And yet the differential between gas and a port city where it's coming in and say the heartland of America isn't all that great. So we looked at broadband pricing. Mm -hmm. Turns out between cities like San Francisco and rural America. The pricing for one unit, a symmetric meg of connectivity, can differ between $10 in San Francisco mm -hmm. and $1,300 in rural America. So 13,000% markup for this commodity. That's not price gouging. I mean, like this, like what is going on here? And of course, part of the problem is like, with oil, you have big signs. It's like you can see exactly what's going on, and people would riot <laughs> if you know gas cost eight thousand dollars a gallon in Illinois. Mm -hmm. But broadband, it seems like we've completely foregone any sort of balancing of pricing structures. Right, and this is a big historical point, which people should be aware of. That for telephone service, we took all these steps. We said it's essential to have a universal, interconnected, non-discriminatory you know, service of very high quality that helps public safety available nationwide. And we accomplished that through uh, the obligation to serve everyone at a reasonable price and through cross-subsidization. So people in urban areas were paying perhaps more than uh, people in rural areas, but um, to enable the people in rural areas to not pay 1,300% more. Um, with the idea of a universal service and with the idea of a basic wholesale network that's available to anybody to provide comp competitive service ab above it, especially where competition is possible in the cities, you can accomplish this kind of reasonable pricing. There does have to be a price control in some fashion in place in order for this to work nationwide. Mm -hmm. And there does have to be, a, uh, one other method could be to ask cable companies and other providers in urban areas to be universal service contributors to ensure that they're helping to subsidize the more rural areas. What we're doing right now is charging rich people a lot of money. Leaving out poor people, you're much more likely to be uh, without a wired connection at home if you're a poor minority or, or you know, low so socioeconomic status. And then having the state take charge of those people who can't afford it wholly, which is putting a larger burden on the, on the rest of us. And another large mistake we're making is saying that smartphone access is going to do it for people who don't have a wired connection at home. That, I think, is a fallacy because right now, 83% or more of uh, people who have smartphones also have a wired connection at home. And people in Seoul told me they would never rely on a smartphone by itself. Because of the usage caps and because of the communication characteristics of a wired, wireless connection, not enough to have uh, Americans in the middle of the country stuck using only wireless. We've got to have fiber running deep all around the country 
to make sure that everybody gets adequate connectivity. So we've talked about robber barons and oil and trains and how they were able to leverage control in one yeah. to prevent access in another. Let's talk about barbershop quartets. Okay, let's. Uh, you're speaking of Rob Topolsky? Indeed. So the guy who discovered the BitTorrent um, reset package story in, for Comcast, the idea that Comcast was, uh, is in a sense, telling computer connections uh, to hang up if they tried to access BitTorrent files. Mm -hmm. It was a barbershop quartet enthusiast, probably still is, yes, and yes. Uh, discovered this and documented it. And it became a big kerfuffle, which leads to the open internet order and everything else. What's interesting about that story is that it shows that an, an amateur discovered something very important about how a network was running its operations, sort of almost by accident, and got an AP reporter to report on it. We have no real visibility into how these networks are being run. Um, uh, computer scientists aren't allowed to go in and examine what's happening. Uh, we don't know what kinds of discrimination are occurring. Um, and that, the asymmetry of information in this area is stunning. The FCC knows much less than it should about how the networks are actually working, where the outages are, um, where uh, backup power doesn't exist. We saw that in, in Sandy and Spades. Um, so we somehow need to raise this issue from amateurism and coincidental barbershop quartet you know, discovery to uh, a much more professional, uh, truly overseen uh, industry that is recognized for what it is, which is the heartbeat, the pulse of everything else we want as a country. We want to make sure that our kids get a great education and that health care is first rate and that climate change research happens, all these things. And yet we're leaving the basic input for all of those efforts, all of those policy directions, untouched by oversight. Of course, originally when Rob was reporting this out, yeah. Comcast said, we're not doing that. And then AP documented that it was, and they were like, well, we're just doing it with illegal materials. And they were like, well, yeah. we've just tried to download the King James Bible, I believe is what they were going for. <laughs> and they're like, well, that was a mistake. And then NASA was like, well, our space photos are also being blocked. And it, but there was a period of time, right, where evidence versus denial was being equally weighed uh, as sort of like, Maybe we should balance this out. And what we were told in the open internet order, and et cetera, was like, well, we've, we've addressed this problem. Mm -hmm. And so now I want to talk about FaceTime and AT&T. Because mm -hmm. this is breaking kind of now. And what AT&T has done is they've blocked access to an application that, in essence, competes with one that they want to charge you for. And the solution, as far as I'm now understanding, is that they've said, well, we're now not going to block it for everyone. We're just going to block it for some users. I see all of these stories as just symptoms of a larger market power structure. If you've got a few actors that are controlling high-speed internet access in America, they will have the right and ability to constrain and price discriminate and pick what happens on those networks. That's a natural outgrowth of their role in society right now. Um, to focus entirely on what they're doing in the discriminatory area isn't of as great interest to me as to look at the market dynamics underlying that. Mm -hmm. That if there was, in urban areas, a lot of competition, for high-speed internet access, and if there was a role for government in examining um, the you know, consumer protection elements of those uh, competitive networks, then um, we wouldn't have the net neutrality spat. It wouldn't exist. It's just an outgrowth of the market mechanics here. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd rather go down to the lower level than try to tussle through one approval or not by one actor of a particular application. I'd like to see open networks that are just a public input into everything we do, like electricity. We're going to open up for questions in just a moment. So I'm going to ask one more. So get them <laughs> ready. And hopefully we'll have a microphone at the ready very soon. You call for 100 megabit per second symmetric I'm connectivity. Say that. I think someone needs to say what's basic. So that's going to be my job today. As a starting point. So. <laughs> The United States has set a national broadband goal by 2020 
of four megabits by one megabit. What are, what are the opportunity costs? Because this is something we do very badly yeah. in the United States. So if we don't get to 100 megabit or a gigabit plus connectivity by 2020, if, we, if we're like, let's aim, let's aspire to four by one. Well, is that right? I thought that the National Broadband Plan called for 100 megabit 400 million homes by 2020. Uh, that was after the National Broadband Plan, but the universal goal, everyone gets access to a four by one. The 100 million to 100, sorry, 100 megs to 100 million homes basically is like the cities of America. I mean, like, mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the rural Republicans because y'all are going to get totally left out of <laughs> that one. But, I mean, what, what, what's the cost? Associated with it. I'm or looking into my crazy magic eight ball and I'm going right. to tell you exactly what we're missing here. I don't know what we're missing. Right. What I do know is that we. But we other came countries are investing because they must have some inkling. Right. Like well, here's the story um, the United States was the source for the first generation of internet innovation. We were it. We came up with this <laughs> idea and we invented the things that use this network. For the second generation, not so clear. And so for me, that's the big missed opportunity. Not to be having, the, not to have the sandbox, the large marketplace that allows us to experiment, build new things, create new jobs, give everybody a chance to make a different kind of living, get a better education. It, this should be part of the dignity and respect we accord to every American. The ability to have, just like they have electricity, a connection that is part of the 21st century economy. We have no path at the moment to get there. And other countries see large markets opening up. So China has said that for every new house that's built, they should be capable of this kind of fiber to the home connection. Um, lots of other countries have set major goals for this, uh, this precise connectivity. For some reason, in America, we're focused on scarcity and sort of a drawing in, a lack of enthusiasm for the, what might be possible with these high capacity connections. And, and I don't get it. That doesn't seem like the country that I signed up for. Excellent. All right, so we're going to take some questions if folks could raise your hand. I'm going to start in the front. Let this be a lesson to everyone to come on down <laughs> to the front in the future. We'll start with these two right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, fascinating presentation. I look forward to reading your book. Oh, good. If you could just say who you are. Uh, my name is Sue Rutledge. Um, I have just retired from the World Bank. Um, my question, you mentioned in the prepared remarks that uh, the Google project for Kansas um, actually was so powerful that it caused a, an upgrade for the debt rating of the city of Kansas. Um, I'm wondering if you think that particular model of Google projects are, is applicable for other cities as well. There's, there's tension about this because I don't want to have uh, Google running fiber for the country. I don't think that's appropriate. I, I think that um, other cities will see what is possible in terms of economic growth and development from having a gigabit symmetric connection. And that is interesting. Having all these startups move to Kansas City, uh, understanding that you can run a meeting from four different corners of the country that appears to be real to the attendees. Understanding what's possible with uh, telemedicine, monitoring older people, going to the doctor without having to actually visit the office. All of that is very exciting. So for me, Kansas City is like the world's fair was to electricity. When we first started off electricity in the United States, we thought it was only good for street lamps. Our imagination was very constrained. And so world's fairs were held all over the country. And Hundreds of thousands of people went to see what was possible, these great illuminations and electrical kitchens and all these things. We, as a country, are only convinced when we can see something. And Kansas City allows us to see what symmetric uh, connections make possible. And that's what I'm interested in. The model of making sure that there's very high connectivity in a, country, in a city is going to be echoed by other cities as the mayors, mayors, Republican and Democrat, want to see this happen where they live. And so gradually they're moving towards it. There are barriers, there are lots of these terrible state laws, um, and incumbents will likely do all they can to block the building of these very fast networks. But you're from the World Bank, so you will appreciate that uh, there is 
strong economic evidence of the correlation between increases in productivity and increases in you know, GDP as a result of uh, advanced communications networks. We're going to see that, I believe, in Kansas City. Good evening. It's yeah. a pleasure to meet you. This is a fascinating subject. My name is Todd Wiggins. I wanted to ask you, one of the things that I noticed that you have, you have such great storytelling capabilities, if you could somehow craft your story so it could be um, developed towards a popular um, venue, such as the Ellen Show, or you know, one of the late night television, or G Jimmy Kimmel. I mean, you could some weave some stories, some jokes into, mm -hmm. you know, sort of make it more uh, pedestrian in some ways, right? Yep. You yep. can do that. So I wanted to ask you, have you had a chance to speak with Mr. Jackson, Mr. Jesse Jackson, because he seems to be on a similar path with trying to help educate people about the potential of access and the necessity mm -hmm. to minority communities across the country. And the last thing I had, a question I have is when you've, uh, I'm sure you've met Mark Cuban, who was a, a great um, cable entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. He made predictions about several years ago about how broadband would affect the cable industry. How much of that has come to pass and what is your prediction as far as industry-wide, how we should lay this out in the future? Should it be in Detroit? Should it be in, in the other impoverished so-called so cities in the country where we could build industry? How, how would you see that layout? So John Stewart, Jesse Jackson, Mark Cuban. Yeah, these are people I don't know and uh, <laughs> I would be my, my goal, all of you well-connected people, my goal is to get on one of the major cable shows. So if you could help me do that, I would, I would appreciate it. And I will, I will tell stories. I will do anything. I'll twinkle all night long if you can just get me on one of those shows. Uh, because really, the, the only priority for me is getting this on the radar screen, just making sure that Americans understand that they have responsibility for this, that it's not something that the mar market is not going to produce this by magic. There is a role for intervention by policy officials to ensure that everybody gets this basic level of co connectivity. And um, we can't, you know, Eisenhower, Republican president, built the interstate highway system so that cities and towns wouldn't be isolated. There are places where government steps in. And uh, we need to change the rhetoric about this so that it can, we can't have this knee-jerk response that government is always bad. There are some collective action problems that can only be resolved by involvement of policy making. Thank you. All right, let's get some hands right here. Uh, thank you, Susan. And great presentation. Thank Earl you. Comstock, former CEO of CompTEL and uh, one of the staff that worked on the 96 Act. Yeah. Um, I was fascinated by your presentation and particularly by your proposed solution. And as a law professor, I guess my question really is very little mention of the Communications Act and the availability of existing law to solve this problem. The solution you s seem to suggest would imply uh, that we need some kind of new action. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on couldn't the FCC, frankly, undertake much of what you're talking about? Because I, I will say from my experience with CompTEL, while it sounds great to talk about individual cities building these fiber rings, mm -hmm. you got to get the infrastructure all the way to the home. And yeah. that's what's proven to be prohibitively expensive. Even to, even to most business offices, it's proven to be expensive. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really question whether just having fiber rings is going to really make a difference. Um, but I mostly was curious in your book, you, you, you mentioned these things, but there's not really any discussion of the fact that it seems to me, under existing law, you could fix this problem if an administration were so inclined. Having spent some time in Washington, I'm impatient with uh, the ability of federal policy to change things quickly. And what I'm looking for is a tipping point where it becomes the air of an inevitability just sweeps over the land. And people say, well, of course everybody needs a fiber to the home connection. And that is only going to happen by a series of incremental moves, first a patchwork across the country, where people see what's possible with these networks. So that's why my first move is to the cities. Because if we try to do this in the abstract, just in this town, I'm not sure it's going to happen. We're, we really need a lot of action locally. I think under existing law, the FCC could accomplish many of these goals. As you know, <laughs> I think you did a fine job drafting the you know, 96 Act. It's all there. We just need to use it. 
Um, but that's proven to be politically extraordinarily difficult here. So, you know, let's move out into the rest of the country, show what's possible, and then have the political apparatus react. That's, that's my direction at this point. We go here. Uh, yes. Raphael oh, please wait. Uh, my name is Rafael De Janeiro. Another duopoly in America uh, delivering a substandard product at high cost is uh, the Democratic and Republican parties. Um, <laughs> Can I use that? That's really funny. That's really good. <laughs> uh, well, what's the connection between those uh, duopolies and monopolies, and uh, what signs of hope do you see in either party or in independent voices? Economics. Yeah, um, I think uh, both of these, uh, in, in both of these sectors, wired and wireless, the political connections are, are very deep and, and strong. And there is no particular upside right now for anybody on the Hill to take on this issue. It's proven to be extremely difficult at the Commission to do anything. Um, because the existing companies could just march on the Hill if the FCC chairman tried to act and gut his agency's budget. Um, so I, I actually don't see that much hope in the current political construct. I'm hoping that this issue, as it becomes more visible and popular and uh, accepted, becomes a rallying cry for politicians. At the moment, they'll just lose a lot of campaign contributions if they dig into this one. Um, and I, I would like to change that situation, but it's not going to change overnight. So I wish I could be more optimistic. I'm sort of ebullient by nature, but this one is, this is hard, and I don't want to pretend that it, I, I'm going to switch that. Go right back here. Mr. Fanasim, I'm a graduate student at the University of Colorado. So one of the slides that you had showed uh, the wireless service revenue per capita, and it was decreasing for Europe, and it was increasing for the US. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, as in, um, doesn't that make the U.S. market more attractive? And which we've seen is in terms of $20 billion from SoftBank for uh, Sprint or T-Mobile's acquisition of Metro PCS. And there's an article in the Raptors this Sunday which showed that the European markets were finding it really hard to f get investment to upgrade to 4G networks and America is leading the way in 4G. So does, isn't that how markets work? Where if the revenue is increasing, it's more attractive, investment comes in, m the infrastructure is upgraded and Europe is lacking in, in, in 4G right now. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are about that. Well, uh, these companies have made their investments and now they're harvesting. So, um, uh, you know, you could say, yes, that's, that's terrific. Um, it is a good thing that the AT&T T-Mobile merger was blocked and T-Mobile has its voice back now. And if we can make sure that the next auction is run in such a way that T-Mobile gets access to low band spectrum, they could really be quite a maverick and put some pressure on AT&T and Verizon. I'm hoping for that. But without a change in policy, the existing companies are just going to keep making more money from the same numbers of people, um, which is, and they have no incentive to run fiber to all of their towers, to uh, ensure that everybody has a reasonably priced service. They're, that's not in their business plan. It, again, there's nothing bad about this. It's just that what you want to do as a wireless or wired company is keep your capital expenditures as low as possible and make as much revenue as possible on top of that. The cap capital expenditures have been made, and now they're harvesting. All right, so let's go to the mid-back area here. We'll go over here. Hi, uh, Matt Starr from Tech Freedom. Um, you said that uh, wireless is not a viable substitute for a wired connection, um, that the two are not competitors. I was curious then um, if there was potentially, let's just totally hypothetical, uh, a merger between, say, Time Warner Cable and Verizon Wireless, would you be okay with that? And if not, why not? Um, I, th I think the reason I'm focusing on the separate markets here is that we need to stop being confused about the level of competition for high-speed internet access in this country. And that the fact that Netflix usage on wireless connections is in the low single digits, and yet is the most popular application used for a wired connection, I think is quite indicative that people are using these two things in different ways. Wireless is very useful, but it's a separate market. So the reason I go into all of that is to try to dispel some of the 
uh, just fog around what is a, a, you know what the wired high-speed internet access market looks like and how much you get to include in that circle when you're talking about the state of American policy, right? I don't think a merger between Verizon Wireless and Time Warner Cable is a great idea um, because at least now Time Warner Cable has some incentive to push out more Wi-Fi in its areas to share its wires or allow people to share wires. Um, has some incentive to, you know, uh, think of other wireless parts of its uh, operations that don't necessarily involve Verizon. By the way, they have essentially, they have essentially merged through the joint marketing agreement. They're, they are operating together, so maybe a formal merger isn't really necessary. Right. Gentleman in the back there. Uh, thank you. My, my name's uh, Stu Whitaker, and uh, I first uh, uh, started working in telecommunications in 1980, uh, which seems it was it was literally decades ago. And so I've I've seen decades worth of uh, of battles similar to what I hear you describing here. I haven't read your book, but I loved your article. I think it was in the New York Times um, a week or so ago. I had just been to an entrepreneur's meeting here in Washington, D.C., where a young entrepreneur, less than half my age, dis, uh, was describing how he was going to introduce red boxes uh, to the uh, uh, H-marts and the other kinds of uh, communities around here that aren't native English speaking. And I, and I thought about that, and I said, okay, he looked at it as a great opportunity. Uh, he said, the people that I want to serve can't afford internet. They can't afford Ford broadband. And I thought to myself, from a public policy perspective, I really would have loved to have seen him get on board with the idea of bringing broadband and internet to his, uh, to his community. But instead, what he saw was a profit motive in, in delivering HBOX type uh, uh, movies to non-English speaking uh, communities. So I say all that to say, look, there, there are tremendous uh, economic forces here and, and, and profit forces that, that are at work. And, and, you know, when I look at, uh, at, at Senator Warren in Massachusetts, she succeeded in, in, in getting a great voice in the Senate. So if you run for the Senate, I would, I would love to support you. <laughs> Otherwise, I, I'm not certain how this is going to happen. So can we talk a little bit about maybe business models? Because I think this alludes to that, right? Yeah. So a reason to have fiber rings in, in municipalities and all that, a reason to free up the 19 states that right now have limitations on alternate business models is, I'm assuming, to maybe spur some competition, lower pricing, yeah. create opportunities for self-provisioning and alternate ways to bring connectivity to underserved communities. Do you see glimmers of hope in that? Or? Oh, sure. I think that it's a, it's a reframing problem. To take what we now think of as a luxury, sort of like a first-run mo movie, a media event, which is high-speed internet access, and make it into something that disappears as just an input, like electricity or water, into everything we do in life, that's the big shift. There can, there's lots of money to be made on top of that facility and lots of new markets to be opened. But unless we get this basic infrastructure in place, those markets don't get a chance to flourish. And that, that's what I'm worried about, is the creation of new m markets on top of the business model of a, essentially a utility. Mm -hmm. And to give you an example of just how absurd some of these state barriers are, uh, I was part of a group that helped set up connectivity after Hurricane Katrina. And part of that was a network that was in and around uh, New Orleans. And when they lifted the state of emergency there, they had to shut down the network because by state law it was too fast for a municipality to provide. Right, and there's a bill that's just been introduced in Georgia that says that if in any locality you can get access to a 1.5 megabit service, which is essentially crappy wireless, <laughs> the municipalities are not permitted to act, not permitted to call for the creation of higher speed internet access, whether they own it or not, not permitted to do anything. That's a sledgehammer of a bill. That's a bill that would keep the status quo in place in Georgia forever. So it's being opposed by a bunch of players. We'll see what happens. But there have been 
efforts like this across the country. And the same thing happened in electricity. The same thing happened. The uh, private utility company said, don't, we, it's, it's Bolshevik <laughs> to have a cooperative involved in providing um, electricity to a, you know, a, a community, that, that that's just sheerly inappropriate. So I'm, I'm being reminded of something that I forgot the last time I gave a book talk, which is that part of my purpose here is to actually ask you to buy the book. <laughs> I completely forgot. I said, oh, it's been so great to talk to you. But in fact, you need, if, even if I've already given you a copy, even if I've already given you several copies, <laughs> you, you, you need to buy the book because the publisher needs to see that people are buying it. So I, I would appreciate that. It would be a great gift to me. So thank you. All right, we're going to take one more and then uh, open it up for more wine and conversing with Susan Thank you. before she has to run out. I know you've got a train. So we'll take one more in the back here. Thanks. I'm Drew Bennett. Uh, I definitely support the thesis that this is a public good and high-speed connectivity um, you know, is in the public interest. I think some of the anecdotes and particularly the pricing discussion actually draw attention away from that and do a disservice. Um, for example, the San Francisco versus rural town, 1,300 to 10. I mean, if, if it cost me $10,000 to build out to 1,300 people, and even you know half of that to build out to 10, then of course, yeah, I can see charging 13 times as much for the 10. Um, and the comparison with oil and, Not and 13, gas. 130 times as much. You said 1,300, okay, 100, still. I mean, over, over time, like a year and a half, a monthly bill, like that, can do that in no time with those types of disparities in population density. Uh, and then when it comes to like, comparing to oil, I, I, don't, I don't see where that goes. Uh, I'd love, love to see the cost of what it costs to get oil out to rural areas. Um, I, I don't think it's that much in comparison. Uh, so let's focus that attention on things like Seoul and on the cost of building out networks in cities like that. And you alluded to you know, some of the benefits they have there, not just density, but political. Um, mm -hmm. So what would it cost to turn Kansas City into Seoul? Uh, I think we're getting an idea of that, but I think like that type of focused attention to talk about what is it gonna cost a mayor in terms of, you know, well, the politics of it, what are the policy steps that a mayor would have to go through, uh, and then what's it gonna end up costing that taxpayer? An analysis like that from New America Foundation or others would really be helpful if we're gonna make all, if the comparison we're gonna start with is Seoul versus the US then that should be the, the analysis that, that comes next. Look, I think very simply, if you treat this as a long-term investment that's going to pay over many decades and that it is going to be expensive to build, but it pays for itself over time, government costs of providing uh, connectivity to government actors go way, way down. In Stockholm, they went down by 40%. Uh, new industries have that input available to them, become more productive, offer more jobs. There's lots of evidence that just as it's expensive to build electricity, but then it pays for itself over time, this kind of connection does the same thing. Right. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. So a number of us are going to be descending next Monday and Tuesday to David Eisenberg's Freedom to Connect to continue these kinds of conversations. See this gentleman if you want a nice, intimate atmosphere to ponder and conspire. <laughs> uh, in the interim, please stick around for more wine and drinks. And please join me in thanking Susan Crawford oh, for being you. an amazing. Thank you, guys.